Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Bellow, Bellows Falls. Bellows or Bellow? Bellows Falls. You got rebuked for that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we bring greetings from uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Some people say Lancaster, but it's Lancaster. It's Lancaster. That's the way to say it. So we're good. We're glad to be here, Sherilyn and I. We've known uh, Pastor Matt and Brenda for many years. We value their friendship. Uh, it's good to see that people are being uh, ministered to here and reached here in, the, in this area of, of the country. Nice uh, driving up here. Well, yesterday actually was raining, so it wasn't so nice, but, but um, we're, we're just, we were talking and saying it must really be nice here when the leaves are turning and all of that uh, earlier, a little couple months earlier. A little bit about us. Uh, I was raised Amish. Anybody know about the Amish? Anybody not know about the Amish? <laughs> I was raised Amish in an Amish home in Lancaster uh, County, Pennsylvania. Sherlin was raised in a Mennonite home. And uh, so I left the Amish when I was 18. I come from a family of 12. I'm the oldest of 12. And um, seven boys and five girls. And when and Pastor Matt was praying for the government, I just had to think I have a brother Lloyd, who is a U.S. congressman, not a not a, a congressman, state congressman, but a U.S. congressman. He's in Washington. He's number he's number ten in the family, and uh, but he's doing a good job there. He's been there for quite a while, and um, so he's a he's I guess I can say he's, his party. He's a Republican, <laughs> and so uh, he has an interesting time anyhow. But. Uh, love him and love what he's doing there but um, I left the Amish when I was 18 because I wanted a car <laughs> they drive horse and buggy you know I wanted a car <laughs> and I wanted electricity and I wanted a, a, a radio <laughs> so so um, sometimes when there's a storm people say well you know I passed Sam I've been out of electricity for four days I said, well, that's nothing. I've, I was without electricity for 21 years. <laughs> it does help a little bit if you're used to it, I'm sure. And um, so when I, when I turned 18, I, I left the Amish. My parents, though, were always, um, they, they weren't as strict as some, so they allowed me to keep uh, living at home, which many do not, and throw their teens out when they leave, which they did not actually allowed me to park my car at the farm. We uh, were raised on an 80-acre farm. And um, actually, actually, my dad, uh, he was a rebel in the Amish community. So for example, uh, the Amish people, they have to have a four and a half inch brim on their hat, right? And my dad had three and a half. So, uh, and uh, you know, just certain things, and he would trim his beard and you're not supposed to trim your beard. So my dad had many visits from the bishop. And so when I wanted to buy a car, Pastor Matt, I didn't have money. You know, I was working on the farm and, and living there and didn't really have any money. So I asked my dad, I said, hey, can you help me buy a car? He said, uh, okay. He said, uh, I'll give you $200 for a down payment if you don't tell anybody. <laughs> so I think he wanted me to have a car so I could drive him around. So we didn't always, so didn't always have to uh, hook up old Tony. That was our name of our horse. But anyway, sorry if any of your names are Tony. I'm not calling you. I'm not calling you. <laughs> so, um, but after I, and, and you know, um, I left the Amherst. There was nothing spiritual about it because I was, I was a partier not necessarily proud of it, but I was, and I don't know if you know this, but some of the Amish young people, some of their parties are the wildest parties you'll ever go to. And uh, I was part of that whole scene. And um, so my parents pleaded with me to go to church somewhere. 
church attendance to the Amish people is very important. So uh, I said, okay, well, I'll go to church, and I look for a church about a, mile, about a mile from the house called Stumptown Mennonite Church. So I went there not because I was saved or anything like that, <laughs> just to please my parents. And I went there, and I, re and I started looking around, and I saw all these nice girls there. So I thought, I like this place. And uh, nothing, nothing spiritual, and that's where I saw her. And I thought, I'm going back there again and again, and I went again and again. And started, uh, you know, getting acquainted with Sherlin. And then we got married in 1968. So if you're good at math, you know how many years we were married. 1968, got married, and um, I wasn't saved. She thought I was, but I wasn't. Actually, when I date her, I would um, drop her off at her <laughs> at her house. Uh, everybody smile at me. You look kind of. You look kind of, everybody smiled at me this morning. And um, so I would take her home, and then I'd go to an Amish party. She told me later, said, if I'd known you were doing that, um, it would be a bye. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't tell her. But anyway, we got married, moved to Phoenix, Arizona, lived in Phoenix for four years. I worked in the hospital there for, for two years, uh, worked at a hospital for two years, and they had, that, that whole staff were partiers, and so they invited me to their party, Sherlin never went with me, and um, I got really messed up there. She started locking me out of the house, and uh, good for her. Everybody give her a hand for locking me out of the house. She started locking me out of the house. But she knew that I wouldn't freeze to death in Phoenix because it doesn't get cold there. So I just lay out in the backyard till morning. And then, I, <laughs> then I'd kick the door in. I wasn't a very nice guy. And, but all that time, Pastor Matt, I was going to church. All that time, I was the head usher at this church. They had no discernment whatsoever. I'm out, I'm out getting partying on Saturday night, going to church on Sunday morning, and being the head usher in this church. And one day, they had this singing group that came to church. It's called the Agape Players. And um, there was something different about them. And uh, I, I told Cheryl, I said, I, I like them. But I didn't like them. But I liked them. But I didn't like them. But I liked them. I said, there's something about, and I was... I was at my wit's end as far as my life. And um, so they had several other uh, places they were ministering or singing. So we followed them around the, the city of Phoenix for three or four nights. And every night they'd have an altar call. And when they'd have an altar call, I'd start to sweat. And I'd start to, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on because our church, we never had any altar calls. And um, so one night, Sherlin said, I'm going to go up and rededicate my life, and I thought, oh boy. And um, so I went up with her and gave my life to Jesus in February of 1972. 50 years ago, my life changed radically. I was going one direction one day and the opposite direction the next day. I went out the next day and bought myself a, a Bible, the Living Bible, paraphrased edition of the Bible. Maybe some of you have that. And I read that Bible through seven times the first year. And I, had a, I got a hunger for the things of God, got a hunger for the Word. And even as a young boy, though, I always felt like I was called to preach. But I never got saved till I was 24 years old. Just started partying as a young Amish teenager and um, just pulled me in. Sin will always keep you longer than you want to stay. And uh, I stayed for a long time. But that night I gave my life to Christ in February of 1972. And then what I felt as a young boy came back to me, um, you know, my, uh, that I'm supposed to be a preacher. And I thought, well, how can I be a preacher? Because I was very shy, I was brutally shy. When the teacher would ask me to, to stand up and read a, out of a book, I would faint in school. And they'd have to revive me and set me on a chair and all that kind of stuff. And so when the Lord called me to preach, I said, I, I, I fall down when I preach. And um, so, and, and 
Besides that, Amish people are not allowed to go to high school. They're not allowed to go to college. So eighth grade education. So who's going to uh, accept me as a Bible school student? Uh, what's Bible school's going to do that with only eighth grade education, no high school diploma? And so we, in the meantime, some of us had, had gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit. We started a Bible study in someone's home, and the Bible study grew to 100 people in someone's home on Tuesday nights. And, and it was, uh, we were praying for people, and people were, uh, we were seeing miracles and healings happening in people's lives. And then one night, uh, uh, somebody from Maryland came over to Pennsylvania. We were in southern Pennsylvania where the Bible study was, and he handed me a magazine called The Word of Faith magazine. And in that magazine was a little article that said uh, a new Bible school was starting in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Rama Bible Training Center. And in fine print, it said no high school diploma needed. And I said, and I said that's where we're going. And so we packed up our two little girls. We had uh, two little girls at the, at the time, five years old and three years old. And we headed for Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, not knowing if we'd ever uh, come back to our area. Always had a secret desire, though, to come back to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and start and minister there. You always you have to watch those secret desires because God will give them to you. And so, in the eighth month of the, it was only a nine-month school. In the eighth month, someone contacted us and said, "There's a small group of people that would like to start a church back here in Lancaster County. Would you come and be the pastor?" And I said, "No, I don't think so." And I thought I'd be an evangelist. I didn't want to be a pastor necessarily. And then I realized, though, that if you're a pastor and you have an evangelism heart, evangelistic heart, uh, those two things go, go together real well in a church. And so we came back and uh, started pastoring there. We pastored there for 40 years, 40 years. And then five and a half years ago, we handed the lead pastor role over to Pastor Matt Milan, he was in our church since he was four years old. And so now Sherilyn and I oversee our network of churches and ministries, worship center network. We also serve as regional director for Rama, uh, right here in the Northeast. It includes uh, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and all of, and Connecticut, and all of New England. And um, so that's what we're doing today. And we are enjoying this season of our life. Um, you know, life has seasons, and you have to embrace the seasons that come your way. Are you all here this morning? Amen. Amen. You know, as we've been traveling around, we have been uh, noticing and, and praying for people, and we've noticed that many people are dealing with anxiety and fear and worries, and maybe they always did, but it seems intensified these days, especially over the last couple years when we were dealing with COVID and all those kind of things, it just seemed like people that never had those kind of issues before have or had those kind of issues during that whole time. And people that had them before uh, were even more that way. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit about and encourage you about battling our fears with faith in God. The text, my main text is in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 where it says, um, uh, what does it say? Anybody know? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, there are, there are many, all kinds of fears that try to come our way and stop our progress in life. Fear of death, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of something bad happening, Fear of disease, fear of accidents, fear of shootings. Now, it's not a matter of not being faced with fears in life. It's a matter of how to, how to face and how to overcome the fears that knock on our door. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, we are pressed on every side by troubles. Do you ever feel that way? We're pressed on every side by troubles. But we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but not abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. It's the Apostle Paul talking. Then he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, 
He says, when we, this is the Apostle Paul, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction with battles on the outside, now watch this, and fear on the inside. That's the Apostle Paul talking. So he dealt with fear in his own life. We live in a world of uncertainty, but we can't just stay in our houses. We can't just stay our, in our homes. We must face and deal with our fears. And every day, our experiences call for us to reach out and have faith in God. I like what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He said, my old self has been crucified with Christ. How many of you are glad that your old self <laughs> is crucified with Christ. Right. I'm glad mine is. The one that used to get locked out of the house, that one's crucified with Christ. He, he no longer gets knocked out of the house or locked out of the house. Did I say knocked out of the house? <laughs> Did you ever knock me out of the house? I know you locked me out of the house. <laughs> My old self has been crucified with Christ. The Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I thought, what does the Apostle Paul mean when he says, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God? What does he mean by that? If you look up the word faith, a number of different meanings for the word faith. One is, it's a firm persuasion. Faith is a firm persuasion, or we could say it's a firm conviction of the truthfulness of God. Or we could say a reliance upon Jesus. I'm talking about faith. To live by faith in the Son of God, then, is to adhere to, rely on, and put our complete trust in Him. Surrender our lives to Jesus. Is, or we could say... Faith is believing what the Bible says in spite of what we're going through in life. In spite of what our circumstances and, and situations are, we believe what the Bible says about our lives, about our circumstances, about our situations, and we believe that and speak that over our lives. Now, fear, on the other hand, so faith is a persuasion, a firm persuasion, a conviction of the truthfulness of God. Fear, on the other hand, is an emotion. It's a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, or pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. Fear. It's an emotion. Faith is a persuasion. Fear is an emotion. Fear also means, has the meaning of flight. Also means cowardly or timid. Fear. Fear can, be, fear can be destructive if we don't um, use our faith to overcome. It can be destructive. For example, do you remember when uh, in the Bible, when God created Adam and Eve, and, and um, so then they, God says, I, you, I want you to take care of Eden, the Garden of Eden. You can, you can have everything here but one thing, that one tree in the middle of the garden I don't want you to touch that tree well they did and before that God would come down the Bible says God would come down in the cool of the day and walk with them and talk with them imagine that and then when they sinned when they took up that one tree that they were not supposed to the one thing <laughs> they did the one thing that they were not supposed to they did sounds like us sometimes doesn't it and uh so then, fear, fear will make you hide. Fear will make you want to hide from the presence of God. Because when God came down after they did that, he came, the Bible says he came down in the cool of the day, and he couldn't find them. He says, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I was afraid. I was afraid. Fear can make you want to hide, makes you want to hide from the presence of God. The very place that our help comes from, the very place that we go to for help in life, in every situation, 
Fear will make you want to hide from the presence of God. Fear will also keep you from winning in the battles of life. There's a story in Judges chapter 7. Gideon was the judge of the children of Israel at the time. And he was surrounded by the Midianites. He had 32,000 warriors. And God said, you have too many warriors. He said, I want you to tell everybody that, is, that has fear and timid, that is fearful and timid to go home. Now, Gideon probably thought, well, it's just a few people going to go home. You know, maybe a dozen at the most are going to go home. So he said, all of you that have fear and are timid, go home. And 22,000 people went home. Fear will keep you from winning in the battles of life. And then I thought about this. In Matthew 25, fear will keep you from using your talents and your abilities for God. There's a story there in Matthew 25 where this businessman, he, he was going to go away for a while, and he called in his servants and said, I'm going away for a, a quite a long time, and he said, I'm going to give you my money to take care of my money. So he gave one guy five uh, uh, bags of silver, Another guy, two bags of silver. Another guy, one. So he was away for a while, and after a while, he came back. And he said to the guy that he gave five, said, how'd you do with my money? He said, I invested your money, and I doubled it. He said, that's good. Good and faithful servant. Now I'm going to make you ruler of many things. And he looked at the second guy, and he says, what about you? I gave you two. He said, I went out, and I doubled it, too. And he said, good, good well done, good and faithful servant. Then he looked at the guy that, that gave one. And what about you? And he says, I knew that you were a harsh man. So I was afraid. So I went and hid your money. I went and hid it. I was because I was afraid. Fear will keep us from stepping out into what God has put in our hearts. Fear will keep you from stepping out into the, the abilities that God has given you. One time we had, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of a man by the name of Miles Monroe. He was a, a great preacher. He's with the Lord now. Uh, he was actually killed in a plane wreck, I believe, and, uh, a couple years ago. And he was at Worship Center. That's the name of our church that we ministered at for 40 years in Lancaster County. And so he came and preached at our church. I'll never forget one thing he said. He said, the richest place in the world is not a diamond mine. The richest place in the world is not a gold mine. The richest place in the world is a cemetery. A cemetery. And he went on to explain. He said, in a cemetery, there are many unwritten books. Many unwritten songs. Many uninvented inventions, many visions and dreams that people took with themselves to their grave rather than doing them while they were alive. So the fear will rob you of your potential. It'll, ro it, it'll rob you of using your talents and abilities and keep you from stepping out. Faith, then... Being a firm persuasion is designed to overcome fear, which is an emotion. Emotions are up and down, but faith stays steady. So by putting faith in God, we can courageously face our fears and overcome them. Are you all here today? Amen. That was a good place to say amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, somebody said, okay, Pastor Sam, if faith is a persuasion, how do I get that kind of faith? I, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't raised in church. My family is not, or friends are not religious. How do I find faith, the kind of faith you're talking about, that is persuaded to believe in God? D.L. Moody, a great preacher, said, 
I prayed for faith and thought someday it would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not come. <laughs> then one day I read in the Bible where it says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then I opened my Bible, D.L. Moody said, and began to read and study and faith has been growing ever since. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So reading, hearing, taking into our heart the scriptures produces faith in our lives. That's where faith comes from. From the word. We can pray for one another, support one another, but really faith only comes from the word. From reading the word. That's why it's so important to have a a Bible reading uh, discipline. You know, read the word like you would, like when, you, you know, most of us don't eat every day. Most of us eat food every day, right? right. Well, this is spiritual food. Right. So in the same way, we should eat spiritual food every day as we eat physical food. When we don't eat physical food for too long, we get weak physically. It's the same way spiritually. If we don't feed on spiritual food, the Bible, scriptures, uh, then we will get weak spiritually. Ever since I was, uh, gave my life to Jesus in February 1972, I've always, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, I've, I've built that discipline in my life. I've always loved the Word of God. And then when I, when I went to Bible school, they emphasized the emphasized the the power of the word and the importance of the word of God, putting that number one in our lives as believers. And so every year I have a Bible reading plan. This year, coming to an end this year now, I, I, I this year all year long, I read one chapter in Proverbs every day. That gets me through Proverbs every month. I read one chapter in Psalms every day that gets me through Psalms about two and a half times in the year. I read um, this year um, one chapter in the, in the Gospels and Acts start in Matthew 1, go to Acts 28 and that gets me through that that's uh, 117 verses, I mean chapters so it gets me through that uh, over two times and then I do one chapter from Romans all the way to Revelations. That's 143 chapters. And so that was my Bible reading plan this year. And so every year I sit down and say, Lord, what, what reading should I do this year? So reading and taking into our heart the scriptures produces faith in our lives. Now, I'm talking about overcoming fear. Let me tell you a personal story. In 1974, Sherlin and I had a 16-month-old son who got out on the road one evening, one October evening, and walked out in front of a vehicle and was hit by the vehicle and died from the impact. The worst day of our lives ever, before and since. He was only 16 months old, and... Uh, but God helped us through that. If he'd be alive, well, he is alive in heaven today, but I mean, if he'd be alive on the earth, he would be 49 years old. And uh, sometimes I still wonder what he would be doing. You know, and um, sometimes, you know, people uh, sometimes say really crazy stuff when things like that happen. They mean well, but when somebody um, experiences a loss, you just go put your arm around their shoulder and you don't say anything because sometimes you say stupid stuff you know, like one person came up to me and came up to us and said well you know uh, that God needed another flower in his bouquet in heaven so he decided to take your son I'm thinking my son's not a flower and God has enough flowers in heaven I know they meant well Another person said, well, Sam and Sherlin, God knew that your son wouldn't turn out well, and so he took him now. 
So don't say, don't say stuff like that. Just not too long ago, there, there was a family in, in our church uh, whose teenage son fell asleep. His car went underneath a tractor trailer on the road, underneath. I mean, clipped the car. And you can imagine what happened to him. And uh, so we were on our way to visit them. And on our way in the house, I said to Cheryl, and I said, you know, I'm not going to say anything. Our presence, your presence ministers to people. When people are going through a rough time, all you have to do is go there and be there with them. Because when people came to the viewing of our son, just their presence is what ministered to us. They didn't have to say a word. And so we went and visited with that family and sat with them for a while and prayed with them. And uh, sometimes it's just your presence that ministers uh, to people. So then in 1978, uh, the Lord blessed us with a second son. And when he was 16 months old, the same age as our, the son that died, uh, I was attacked with fear one day that the same thing would happen to him. I'll never forget it. That fear paralyzed me for several days, Pastor Matt. I remember, you know, fear thoughts come from the outside. They don't come from the inside. They come from the outside. And paralyzed me. I wouldn't let him out of my sight because those thoughts were coming in. Something's going to happen to him. Keep your eyes on him. Something's going to happen to him, just like it did to your, to Christopher. Something's going to happen to Jamie, just like it did to Christopher. And I had to keep my I couldn't go to work for a couple of days. But I didn't want to live like that. By that time, I was a Christian for about seven years. I was a young pastor. I was hungry to know the Bible. And I had come back from Bible school and was starting to pastor the church. And I remember... When I was going through that, I remembered what I learned at Bible school, that uh, one of the instructors said, whenever you go through something in life, if you go through a, uh, circumstances or situations in life, find scriptures in the Bible that pertain to your situation and begin to believe them and begin to speak them over your situation. So then I thought, okay, this fear cannot paralyze me like this for several days I wouldn't go to work so I went to work and I, f I went to, uh, to the Bible and I found this scripture in Isaiah 54 17 it says but in that coming day I don't know what coming day that means in that coming day but I'm taking it to mean in that coming day when I'm faced with a bad situation in that coming day, it's probably taking it out of context a little bit, but, you know, that's how I took it. In that coming day, that coming day when, when you're dealing with something, uh, some circumstance or situation, and it says, no weapon formed against you will succeed. This will, you will silence. This is, this is the, 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 the sentence that got me. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. And that's what was happening to me. Something's going to happen to your son. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Those voices were just coming in there. It says you will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. And so I began to, to speak that. And, and when I started to speak that, I'm just giving you an example, okay? When I started to speak that, the other voices were louder than, than, than I mean, they're loud. Something's going to happen to him. Something's going to happen to him. And, you know, I started to say, um, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon formed against me will prosper. That's what it sounded like to me. These were louder. That was weak. And the more I said it, the stronger that got. And the stronger that got, the weaker these voices got. 
So no weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Something's going to happen to him. Something's going to happen to him. Something's going to happen to him. And then the other scripture that I used was the text that I opened up with today. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Sometimes fear is a spirit. And you just need to, you need to come against it in the name of Jesus and say, I have a spirit. I have the spirit of, I have a, a sound mind, spirit of power and a spirit of love and a sound mind. And so the more I spoke those, the fear had to leave and I overcame that fear. Wasn't easy though. Wasn't easy. Tried to hang on. But acting on these two scriptures put faith into me to face and subdue the fear. You know, when COVID-19 hit, Sherlin and I right away went to Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He is our fortress and our shield. We will not fear deadly disease, is what it says. So we can choose to live in fear, or we can face our fears by applying God's word to our fears. <laughs> Are you here this morning? As long as we're growing and moving, fear will try to rule us. Anytime we risk, anytime we stretch, anytime we put ourselves out there, out there or step toward a new vision or step toward something that God has put in our heart, we will experience or have the opportunity to fear. And as we take steps of faith, taking a, sim a single step forward robs fear of its power. Amen. When I was a little boy, I was the shyest person you'll ever meet. I, my parents didn't send me to school until I was seven because of that. And when I went to school, I would, I would sit over in the corner when everybody else would be out playing. I'd sit over in the corner for three weeks I did that, not just with my head between my knees, just feeling sorry for myself, until one day this little boy comes up to me. He says, I'll be your buddy. He said, my name's Moses, and I'll be your buddy. Well, Moses and I became friends, you know. And never underestimate the power of encouragement because that little word of encouragement started getting me out of my shell. A word of encouragement is powerful and can bring a person out of what they're experiencing in life. So don't ever hesitate to give a word of encouragement. So I lost track of Moses. He stayed Amish. I didn't. We went to school together the first to the fourth through the fourth grade. After that, I didn't see him until a couple years ago. We had a young man in our church who was an usher, got killed in a motorcycle accident, and he was the only member of his family that had left the Amish. So 300 Amish people came to our church for this funeral. And so now we're in the funeral meal, and here comes this guy walking up to me, big, long, white, straggly beard and big, long hair. And he comes up and puts out his hand. He says, uh, do you remember me? And I said, no. He said, I'm Moses. I said, you mean the Moses that said you'd be my buddy? He said, that's me. And I had an opportunity to thank him for encouraging me like that because I believe looking back, that was what started getting me out of my shell. So, you know, like I said earlier, when I was, felt called to preach, I said, Lord, Lord, I, 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 I can't get up in front of people. And then one day in Bible school, the founder of the Bible school, he was uh, preaching from 2 Corinthians 3. And one of the things that it says in there, it says, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. And I thought, yeah, that's me. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. And that helped me that day. That helped me. That set me free on the inside. So through the years, my friends, every, I mean, even this morning, you know, every time before I get up and preach, I say, Lord, you've made me an able minister of the new covenant. You've not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Speaking the word brings life to us. And I decided that if I have to do it afraid, I'm just going to do it afraid. Yeah. And every time I've gotten up, including today, 
Fear is robbed of its power in my life. Every time you step out and do something that you're afraid of, fear will be robbed of its power. We walk by faith, not by sight. Several years ago, we had Nick Walenda. You know that name? Nick Walenda? You know the, the wire walker? You know who I mean? The wire walker. He walked across the Niagara Falls on a wire. Never heard of him? He walked across a portion of the Grand Canyon on a wire? And he's a Christian. He's a deeply devoted Christian. So we had him come to our church and give his testimony. And after he, was, after he, he preached, went out to, to lunch with him, I said, Nick, why do you do that? You walk out, I mean, right out on this wire. Why? He said, Pastor Sam, it's my calling. I said, you're calling? He said, yeah. I said, how, how, why would you say that you're calling? He said, Pastor Sam, it's my calling. He said, every time I get out there, I'm encouraging somebody to do something they never thought they could do. And if you ever watched him, he's walking on that wire, and every step he takes, he's saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I walk by faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you, Jesus. And he's up there with that, with that big, he has a big, wide pole. He's going out there across Niagara Falls. And it's his calling. I told him, that's it. I said, Nick, I'm glad I'm not called like that. <laughs> we all have different callings. God's ex God expects us to step out on the rope, on the wire of our calling. And then I, I did ask him, Pastor Matt, I said, do, do you have fear? He said, Pastor Sam, are you crazy? Of course I have fear. He said, I decided long ago that I'm just going to do it afraid if I have to do it afraid. But he said, it is true, though. Every time I do it, I get more experience, and I have more confidence and more faith to do it. Jesus, in his life, the things Jesus did in his life and ministry teach us about faith and how to overcome fear. Let me just tell you this story. You know, um, one, time, one time there was a man by the name of Jairus that came to Jesus and said, uh, will you come to my house? Was it his servant or his daughter? His servant. His daughter was sick and dying. And um, Jesus said, I will come. I always like that. Jesus said, I will come. I will come. That's our Jesus. I will come. <laughs> he will come. He will come to your house by the Spirit. He will come. And then he was detained by ministering to people, especially the woman with, that we call the woman with the issue of blood. In Mark chapter 5, you can read about this. And then as he was just finishing up, uh, ministering to the lady somebody comes from Jairus' house they say don't trouble the master any longer a daughter your daughter is dead and when Jesus the Bible says Jesus overheard what they said to Jairus and he looked at Jairus and he said do not fear only believe do not fear only believe so our belief and our faith is stronger than fear so we have a choice to make. Every time bad news comes, are we going to fear, give in to fear, or are we going to use our faith in God and right away address the fear? <laughs> Amen? Amen? So, yeah, so Jairus had a choice to make. Am I going to uh, allow fear to take over my mind and my emotions, or am I going to keep believing and Jesus went up, went home and raised up the girl so faith opens the way for God to do great things through us faith is a firm persuasion putting our trust in God fear is an emotion that can be destructive but is subject to faith faith is for everyday living by applying scriptures to our fears and circumstances fear will produce anxiety panic and worry Faith will produce confidence and peace 
in our lives, and that's what we want. That's what everybody, what everybody wants. Peace is what we all want and desire. Did you know that peace is a gift? Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross, he says, I, I leave you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. I leave you with a gift. It's not something we work for. It's a gift to receive peace of mind and heart. For all of us to receive right here in this room this morning. Sherlin wrote a song. It's called Peace I Leave. I want her to come and minister that song. And while she does, let me, let me uh, finish my sermon by telling you a story, sharing a story with you. With you. We can receive peace in the middle of a storm. You know, one time Jesus was out and, and there was a storm and he was in a boat with his disciples and a storm came, you know, and the Bible says that he was sleeping with his head on a cushion down in the boat and the storm was raging and the, and the disciples, they went to say, don't you care that we drown? And Jesus, he says he got up and stood up and he said, peace be still. And it says there was a great calm. A great calm. So we can experience a great calm in the middle of a storm of life. So they had this artist's convention. And in this artist's convention, they asked the artists to paint a picture of that depicted peace and serenity. So they all... You know, they painted pictures of meadows and flowers and streams and, you know, everything peace, that would say peace, peaceful, except the guy that won the, te the, the whole contest. He painted a picture of a raging storm. And the, the waves crashing up against the rocks and thunder and lightning on his picture, a raging storm, and then in the middle of the rocks there was a little opening in this picture and this little opening was a little bird had a little nest, little birds and this bird was singing singing that's us we're like that little bird Singing in the middle of a storm. Did you know that when you have a storm and sometimes you don't feel like praying, just start worshiping. Just start thanking God. You know, when we lost our son and we were for several days just saying, Lord, why us? Why? 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 You know, that usually doesn't get you an answer. And one day, Sherlin said, I think we should just worship God. And I said, okay. So we went to our Bible study group. She led worship. This was between the time he died and the funeral. Between there. And we, she led worship. And we just worshiped God. And sometimes in the middle of a storm, if we can just worship God, instead of asking why, and be like that little bird, just singing his praises in the middle of a storm. That's where the victory is for our lives. This song is called Peace I Leave. Just, just open your hearts and receive it, and then I'll come up and, and finish up. Sorry, that's wrong. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. So let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid, for God 
has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel that I believe. I am persuaded that she is able but is to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the sound words that you hear me say in faith and in love that's in Jesus. Now peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, so let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, for God has not given us spirit of fear. But of power and of love and a sound mind. But of power and of love and a sound mind. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just thank you for that peace. We thank you that that's a gift that you've already given to us. So, Lord, I just ask that if there's anyone here, and experiencing fear, Lord, that they would just reach out and receive that peace that has been already provided for them. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. How many, how many of you would say, I deal with anxiety and fear in my life? Any of you? I want to pray for you just where you are. I also had this in my heart when I was praying about this morning when I was praying about uh, the service it came to me strained I wrote it down strained family relationships strained family relationships so I want to pray for that too and another thing that came to me is um, unsaved loved ones in your family family members that are not saved that haven't come to Christ let's all stand together let me just pray Father thank you for uh, every person in this room Lord thank you for the word of God I pray that the word would bring forth fruit and that we be doers of the word and not hearers only and Lord I pray for those that have strained family relationships whoever they are Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts. I pray that someone would be the hero and say, I'll be the first one to go and ask for forgiveness. I will be the first one to go and take responsibility for my part. So, Father, I pray for family relationships, especially through the, 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 the Christmas season when families come together. Lord, I pray that there would be peace in the homes represented here in the name of Jesus. And then, Lord, um, I pray that you would give us boldness uh, as we have opportunity to share our story with those that have not yet received Jesus. And, Lord, we claim every family member for the kingdom of God. We claim that every home would be, would be whole as far as whole with all being uh, in the kingdom of God and Lord we claim them we pray that their hearts would be softened their spiritual eyes and ears would be open to the truth and Lord if they won't listen to family then I pray that you would send someone across their path that they would listen to and that their hearts would be open to thank you Father thank you Father and then Lord those who deal with fear and anxiety and even panic attacks 
Lord, we speak peace. We speak peace. Lord, you've given us a gift, peace of mind and of heart. Say, I receive. Everybody say it. I receive the gift of peace. Peace of mind. Peace of heart. Thank you, Jesus, for that peace in my life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And everybody said amen and amen. Amen. God bless you.